So the talk is called Accidental Propaganda, and it's almost exactly what is written on the tin. However, we still have to do some housekeeping. In case somebody missed the last hour, I'm Evgeny Puzankov. I'm a freelancer and narrative designer with like five, nine years of industry experience. I'm not a political scientist. I'm not a sociologist. I've been just trying to figure out uh, how did we end up where we are. And uh, I, uh, the production value of the talk is uh, purposely uh, small, pur purposely lower, just because I have been rewriting it a lot. But it should be still pretty fine. So a little bit of housekeeping first. We need to talk about propaganda specifically so that we can have a civilized discussion about this stuff. I'm not using the term propaganda as a pejorative specifically. Uh, in the, in uh, the context of this talk, propaganda is just a promotion of idea. It's not a promotion of idea that you don't agree with specifically. And propaganda by itself actually was uh, a victim specifically of uh, this uh, of propaganda itself because after World War One, when suddenly everybody realized that the enemy did not eat babies, in fact how the media has been talking to them. Uh, the term propaganda uh, got this current pejorative uh, idea in, and uh, PR council and PR in general became, uh, came in to take over for the propaganda specifically. We will also not be talking about agitational propaganda whatsoever. Agitational propaganda is the one that is supposed to incite action and to turn fear into terror, specifically. This is the ones that you see in uh, wartime situations. We'll be talking about integrational propaganda. It's the insidious and slow one that is uh, supposed to turn habits uh, and traditions into culture, specifically in prejudices into a sure fact. And uh, just to narrow uh, own it down, uh, pop culture has always been a vehicle for propaganda itself. Uh, one of my favorite examples is uh, the, co the campaign for the designated driver. Uh, designated driver is a term originating from here, from Scandinavia. However, it didn't pick up very well in Americas uh, until Harvard Health Institution uh, started the campaign when they approached screenwriters and TV writers to insert the term uh, designated driver into uh, their shows, specifically Cheers, LA Low. LA law. And uh, of course, pop culture was not the, uh, and TV was not the only uh, thing that was uh, actively acting on this designated driver. As you can see, Coca Cola also jumped in on this stuff. However, it's largely credited for being the instigator and uh, how this campaign specifically broke out. And uh, it did, did a lot of good things from 1988 to 1992. Uh, traffic related fatalities regarding DUIs have dropped by 24%, and part of that is uh, of pop culture. But we will be talking about accidents. This was a designed campaign specifically. Uh, a lot of thought went into that. We'll be talking about when propagation happens on accident. And sorry for the long introduction in this regard. Uh, like the most latest example would be specifically Thanos. Uh, Thanos got a lot of criticism for basically justifying abuse, as in, he loves you, and that's why he abuses you. And that could be uncomfortable for a person who is coming into a movie theater with, a, with a, uh, an abusive parent, and they see how Thanos reacts to Gamora, and how he acts on it. Of course, this is a unique situation, but we'll be talking later about that. Also, uh, this talk is designed specifically for writers. However, game design and art overlap a lot. Uh, shit is holistic, everybody is in the same boat. It's just that writers our job is very much similar to the job of propagandists because our job is to sell the plot, to sell the premise, to sell the world, to create the immersion so that the player keeps going. And a lot of tools that we use actually parallel with propagandists. One of my favorite ones is uh, very simple, it's Ethos Logos Pathos which is also a term from rhetoric specifically, I think Aristotle. Uh, ethos being the source of the information, logos being the message, and pathos being the emotion with which it is uh, delivered. And uh, mix matching those uh, can create certain impression and color certain idea a uh, different, uh, different way. Like for example, uh, the approach to Piper in Fallout 4, uh, for me, uh, the message is uh, kind of okay. The pathos is uh, the usual uh, mass media uh, uh, mass media pathos. However, the source, at least for me, being a Russian, uh, I do not trust mass media whatsoever. So the source discredited both the message and the pathos. For somebody else who trusts independent journalism, it might have been very different. Uh, look at how they did it with General Hux in Star Wars. Uh, the message is flimsy. The source, I the pathos is completely over the top uh, Hitler-like uh, lunatism, which, dis uh, which discredits the source of General Hux and discredits the source of uh, essentially the First Order. And this is the tool that uh, just made us uh, feel like First Order is actually the antagonist. Uh, 
On top of that, we also create information, we create exposition, we create events, and we create doubts, which are the vehicles of propaganda since times immemorial. All that we do it to suspend disbelief and to create uh, an escape for the player so that they can experience the situations through which they have not been, basically exposing them to another layer, another pocket of propaganda, another pocket of uh, ideas that they are exposed to, where they can act and uh, on these situations. And even though like, uh, you might not think that you are doing something insidious or you are hurting somebody, the problem is that reality creates fantasy and fantasy supports reality. Uh, of, of our implicit biases that we are unaware can trickle down. A lot of writers, uh, for a lot of writers, writing is actually a therapy in some ways. Uh, like Mario Vargas Llosa said, uh, writers exercise their own demons. The current climate, uh, the current uncertainty or something like that can also act on this reality. And when this reality creates fantasy, that fantasy reintegrates the same reality and reinforces it by basically uh, propagating the same ideas. Uh, to further on the point, uh, think about different, uh, specifically, American heroes. Superman, Captain America, and Spider-Man. And yes, Spider-Man is the most American hero out of, all, of all of them. Uh, Superman is, uh, uh, I think, well, the reality of Superman is omnipotent God, basically. The, um, uh, the omnipotent America that is the city on a hill, exceptional in many ways, which supports the reality of uh, the same situation. Captain America, initially designed basically like B.J. Blaskovich. His only job was to kill Nazis eventually became the idealistic America, supporting uh, those particular ideals. And of course, Iron Man uh, um, in uh, the infinite, in Civil War also jumped in on the other side of America. And Spider-Man is essentially the reality of America being suddenly getting all of this power and struggling to find ways to cope with that and how they, uh, how they should be responsible with this regard. And they, uh, they mirror the reality and they recreate it. Sometimes, with these examples, there, is a, uh, there is a, can be a lot of conversation regarding how they, view, how they can be viewed in the world. However, there is a very clear example of how supporting this, re of how reality creating fantasy actually hurt people. I present to you Apu from Simpsons. Uh, Apu from Simpsons was created uh, initially as just a note. Uh, there is a clerk in the shop, and in brackets, not Indian. However, during the table read, the actor who was doing the voice work, um, he, uh, because of the reality of uh, the particular era, where it already was a cliché, he decided it would be funny if we would use this cliché, and as such, he supported the cliché, even further propagating it. And for many South Asian, uh, South Asian population in America, it was the only example of people who look like them. Which was, uh, which is right now. I highly recommend watching the documentary "Problem with Apu" and uh, even South Park rendition on that. Of course, we can break reality. We can affect that. That has been transgress. This has been the job of transgressive art for a long, long time. Um, this is more of a marketing example, but the reality of The Last of Us initially was that on every poster, and Sony demanded it, there is supposed to be Joel in front and Ellie in the back. But the Naughty Dog uh, refused to do that, and as such, they broke in the cycle in some ways. Another element of propaganda is, of course, somebody has to order it, somebody has to control it, which is usually done by regulation. Uh, there is a lot of interesting stories about Hollywood and literature in general when it was commissioned or it was specifically uh, curated by uh, forces that um, wanted to uh, further some agenda. I recommend you to uh, look up uh, the amount of movies made by Hollywood uh, where US military requested changes uh, for the script in exchange for donating uh, arms, to vehicles and uh, uh, basically props. Some of them are not so much, but some of them are really big. Uh, some, uh, for example, uh, they have actually re uh, refused to support Independence Day with jets, uh, but because um, to show that uh, an Air Force pilot is dating a stripper would be uh, would be not would be not in line with how U.S. military uh, shows itself. In our case, though, we don't have the uh, Hayes Doctrine that was in the movies. We don't have the censorship specifically. We are largely unregulated, with one specific exception. We are players' bitches. We have to support the stereotype, not even like the player as individuals, just a, a, a stereotype of a player specifically, which is constantly changing, but to reach the most people we are following this specific regard. The example that I really love how this can run away is uh, uh, from Batman Telltale series. Uh, this is the story actually told by Emily Grace Buck. I have no idea whether she is and can confirm it. 
Uh, but uh, the story that she told on the Scriptlock podcast was that in the episode five, uh, Selena Kyle rejects Bruce Wayne's uh, confession of love because they have been just uh, known each other for a week and essentially Bruce Wayne pulled off Ted Mosby. And there was a backlash uh, in the forums, in the media regarding that decision, which is kind of dumb in every way. I mean, yeah, this is not how dating works. And again, Ted Mosby is a thing now, but we had to get there somehow. And of course, the dating in the video games and romance, which we have already touched upon, does not help with this regard. This is not the read on Dragon Age Inquisition specifically. It's just almost all of the romance that we do in the game is usually just a series of actions that will eventually lead to sex or to a romance or something like that. And people just kind of got used to it. It's not something terrible right now. We can fix it. We, can, uh, we are actively working to uh, deliver it properly. However, we have also let uh, another things which we are basically propagating to run away. For example, the violence in combat. Nathan Drake on paper is a homicidal maniac. Nathan Drake killed more people than the most effective snipers in World War II. Nathan Drake killed more people probably than B.J. Blaskovich. He destroyed stuff, he uh, murdered people all for trinkets. Which on paper is insidious as hell. This is not something that we should be uh, backing upon. And I'm not saying it as a lewd narrative dissonance. This is just the reality of our game. The violence in video games is essentially like blood and violence in Tarantino, game, in Tarantino movies. We do not notice that anymore. And uh, it's essentially uh, climate change and uh, greenhouse effect going rampant. I have no idea how we can get out of this. But we do that because the players demand it to be fun. The players know that uh, the, uh, the gunplay will be fun, that the violence will be eventually provide them some fun and some escape. I don't have much to say about this topic anymore except being really angry and mad. I will just leave this particular slide on screen for a little while. <coughs> so, but... Um, Outside of gameplay and the stuff that we can't uh, fix anything about, outside of implicit biases from which a lot of stuff talked about, uh, let's try to figure out how uh, we still do that even outside of the situations, just to make the talk even more depressing. And this is usually the management of priorities specifically. Uh, just to jump on the uh, bandwagon of hating crunch, which is absolutely viable, in my opinion, crunch is horrible. Uh, the priorities dictate how much, how many resources are allocated to a, a certain topic, a certain feature, a certain design. If there is not enough time, because of, for example, uh, because of the pipeline or the production, then the writer would use shortcuts, tropes, and stereotypes to do that. The shortcut being, for example, uh, just going for us versus them scenario. The tropes being, you know, all of the tropes essentially, and the stereotypes being what they think is good or what they think is not good, and what they think will get a laugh and what they think will not get a laugh. During the crunch, it even gets even worse because they, there is no time to actually feel and review the situation and to reflect on this. And uh, like, to show how it goes, basically, I, I hope you have seen The Great Detective and many other Disney movies and so on, where the uh, villain specifically had certain traits uh, that uh, became asso they are associated with other people. Retigan is not specifically, and not in this GIF, is a little bit camp, a little bit manieristic. Uh, many villains uh, were more effeminate, while the protagonist was uh, specifically masculine which is a shortcut and a trope of juxtaposing those situations. Uh, it might be, uh, there are plenty of other examples across the media and across the tropes. And uh, we even uh, are so deep into the Stockholm syndrome with tropes that we call them something more nice. And I'll show the worst example possible, the damsel in distress situation. Uh, a lot has been talked about, but the whole name damsel in distress is a cop-out on this regard, because it's not damsel in distress, it's get the MacGuffin. You can switch a woman in this scenario for a shiny thing. And this is uh, the insidious things about the trope. It doesn't look this way. It still looks bad, but not as bad as it could be. And I firmly believe that in terms of priorities, everything is a creative choice. You have chosen, chosen to not allocate the resources. You have chosen to focus on other things. And this can lead to uh, problems not only with uh, using shortcuts that are reality, but reality that shouldn't be supported. It also might be stuff that you have never thought about. Um, the example that I want to use is Tomb Raider reboot. Uh, I'm not talking about Rise of Tomb Raider and Shadow of Tomb Raider because I didn't play them. And Tomb Raider, I freaking hate this game in almost every way. For status, she is also a homicidal maniac. 
which I, I think I should point out. But if you don't know the story, Tomb, Ra of, uh, Tomb Raider is basically Lara Croft uh, crash landing on an island that is basically like Bermuda Triangle, and uh, she has to grow by killing a bunch of people and then finally saving her friends. And because of the shortcuts and tropes, they use almost all of the story can be divided into tropes. Almost all of the feminist, all of the femi female characters can be uh, represented as a trope. Uh, the whole story is Lara Croft is saving a damsel in distress from historical goddess with some support of a token character, essentially. But the, um, the accidental propaganda that I want to talk about is the enemies. All of the enemies in this game specifically are male. Uh, the problem with that is that all of, them, uh, all of these enemies are supposed to be uh, survivors of the shipwrecks and uh, crashed airplanes. Why are they all male? Do women not fly? But the problem with that is that they propagate the theory that civil navy is a complete sausage fest. I googled this stuff, and a lot of uh, actually uh, captains of the civil vessels, uh, not like comparatively, it's still a sausage fest. But there are a lot of captains of uh, of sea ships on uh, in civil navy. A lot of them are actually in the Pacific Ocean, where the uh, Tomb Raider takes place. And uh, a lot of people with whom I workshop this presentation, they did not even notice that uh, because this is just the propagation. Navy is a uh, navy is a male job, while it's not. And uh, in this situation, in specific Larkov, it could be another uh, feminist uh, example, which is the game is supposed to be. It's marketed specifically that. Uh, but of course, there is a, a priority, right? Like um, maybe there are not enough resources, and they just use the same model and uh, only male animations and so on. There, nothing could be done. But really, they couldn't cut anything. Ah, they could have cut so much to just. Uh, I'm pretty sure that those death scenes could be cut out, and they could do the female enemy. Now, I've been talking about priorities, but however, it might be more insidious with the concept of moral licensing. They already have a female protagonist. They already have a female writer. Why bother? They're already good, which is an actual psychological term where you do something, you do, uh, good people actually do bad things just because they think, well, they're good. They can let something go. The easiest example is uh, rewarding yourself with a cigarette when you haven't smoked for 30, uh, for 30 days, but it can go even more and more insidious. Also, moral licensing uh, or the part of accidental propaganda is when you create something that can be used as a token by a certain group. For example, uh, a lot of conversation around uh, female protagonists uh, featured Lara Croft as like, yeah, we have female characters, without mentioning that it's the one at that point. Now it's, of course, a changing, but still not enough, and it's used as a moral license. We are already good. Why bother? Moving on from Tomb Raider, because I'm getting progressively angry. <laughs> Um, the most uh, used uh, trope uh, for like last half a century, for la last century to be honest, in pop culture and in video games is us versus them. Us versus them is an incredible propaganda vehicle. It, was, it has been used since time immemorial to unite people, essentially the concept of common enemy. We are us, we have to fight against them, even if us are different. Soviet Union and allies are different, but they are fighting against Nazis. So they are kind of also us, and so on. And we have been doing that for a long, long time without actually noticing like how these them are created. We just have a set of labels with these particular boxes, and if uh, a certain person ticks certain labels, we shove them into one of those, those boxes, effectively radicalizing them by rejecting them, uh, basically putting them in the same box with, uh, as with uh, I will just call them assholes, will make them uh, more susceptible to this asshole situation, which is insidious by itself. And the best example of us versus them being used for specifically propaganda is, of course, Battles of Thermopylae, where uh, Battle of Thermopylae was, written by, uh, was pro promoted by uh, Herod Her 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 Herodotus, the guy who wrote histories, the Greek guy. Uh, and it was used to uh, promote the Greek uh, nation. Uh, it was a nationalistic approach, not like just a bunch of city-states, Sparta, Athens, and so on, but Greek. And to do that, they, uh, he um, upped the ante on... Uh, not upped, he turned uh, Persians to 11 as evil people. And the weirdest part about that is uh, he actively lied. Like, it's widely known that Persia was, uh, has, uh, ha had slavery outlawed, while Sparta subsisted on slavery, specifically. And you, while doing uh, in video games, us versus them, we can also do that. We can overshadow certain concepts just to create this them, because them are an ultimate evil, and the ultimate evil requires ultimate justice. And because ours is the 
medium of violence at this point, we have to provide the player with the idea of ultimate justice so they don't feel bad when they're escaping somewhere, which is a bit Huxley and bullshit, but <clears throat> anyway. Sometimes it works, though. Um, like Doom, uh, we are fighting demons. Uh, ultimate justice is entirely constituted. But if you look at Nathan Drake, who actively disperses ultimate justice to people who are not necessarily require that, that becomes a bit problematic. Now, the talk of, about propaganda would not be complete without talking about Nazis. So, uh, this is the Wolfenstein, two new, Wolfenstein New Order, specifically, and I don't have much uh, to say about this game. It's a really good game. Essentially, it's a vehicle to uh, have a cathartic effect of killing a lot of Nazis. I think everybody can get behind that. Nazis are a real-life ultimate evil that we can all agree on, at least now. <clears throat> Uh, but there is uh, one issue that, I've, uh, that Wolfenstein actually shows quite well. And uh, this is more uh, complex uh, accidental propaganda because it's actually uh, it's not that obvious specifically. And it's the satire paradox. The satire paradox was coined, uh, I think it was coined by Malcolm Gladwell in his uh, podcast Revisionist History when he was talking about the character Loads of Money. Anybody British here? Anybody knows the guy? Uh-huh. So, Loads of Money was a character created to satirize uh, Margaret Thatcher economy specifically, and the people who got instantly rich and started flanging it around. I'm pretty sure in every culture there are some examples. Problem is, he became a poster child for the very people he was supposed to satirize. Another example is Tina Fey's uh, representation of Sarah Palin, which was... Uh, Sarah Palin, if somebody doesn't remember, it's the US senator who sees Russia from her house in Alaska. I think that's... Oh, she also insane. But uh, in order to get to ratings and so on, at one point they put Tina Fey in uh, her Sarah Palin impression and Sarah Palin together with her, letting in Sarah Palin on the joke, accidentally legitimizing Sarah Palin. Um, and Sarah Palin has a very good eyesight, apparently. And, and the best example is uh, Stephen Colbert's character. Uh, which is basically a hardcore Republican. He represents everything that Democrats hate about Republicans. Problem is, the stuff that Democrats hate about Republicans is what Republicans love about themselves. And uh, eventually, this particular character became uh, almost a role model for some of this, uh, of some of this, uh, of for the people he was supposed to satirize. And the problem here, uh, it, it's very, it's pretty much a success in terms of comedy. He basically appealed to everybody. However, the whole purpose of it was uh, completely irrelevant. And this is what the satire paradox about. So, in terms of Wolfenstein New Order, I just wanted to think, how would Hitler think about representation of Nazis here? He would fucking love it, right? This is basically promotion of Nazism. They went to Moon, they went to Venus, they create amazing things, they create AI, they create robots and cyborgs. And this is a very, very extreme example, because right now Nazis are still ultimate evil. However, if we go further down the road with, propaga uh, with, um, uh, uh, with uh, more exception of white supremacy, which is not specifically something that we do, it's just something that is happening, this might become a problem. Now, let's go to Wolfenstein to the New Colossus and tackle even the more bigger problem, which is why I was terrified to give this talk. So Wolfenstein 2, the new Colossus, is no longer pulp about killing a lot of Nazis. It's, uh, machine games have tried to go deeper. Machine games have uh, given the Blaskovich some depth. And Blaskovich was essentially just a vehicle to kill Nazis. He had no other personality whatsoever. In Wolfenstein 2, the new Colossus, we show his family, we show his aspirations. He no longer wants to kill Nazis just because that's his job. He wants to protect his children. He wants to give them a better future, and so on. Uh, and uh, it also tackles the situation of 1960s America, how would the white supremacists in America back then would react to Nazism and so on, which, like I said, is pretty fucking appealing in this game, if you are already primed to think that. And this brings us to the Stormtrooper Paradox, which is my, one of my favorites. It was coined after The Force Awakens, and specifically regarding Finn. Because Finn is the only stormtrooper that broke through brainwashing and who uh, actively defected and joined the resistance. The problem with that is, he is literally the only one. Everybody else is still used as a cannon fodder. Star Wars have never tried to... Star Wars characters and the Resistance, who are good guys, rebellion, they never tried to uh, save them, and they're just victims of brainwashing, essentially. However, of course, putting uh, Star Wars to this amount of scrutiny, or the, the series that has always been black and white to the bone, would be quite dumb. 
And I'm going to do the same thing with Wolfenstein 2 right now. Again, this is a very, very extreme example. I don't want to use the examples that are actually in real life, for example, Far Cry 5 specifically. But in Wolfenstein 2 The New Colossus, there is a Nazi who joined their resistance. It's the one, and it was relegated to the comic relief part. I haven't played DLC though, so I might not know that. All we do in the whole game is uh, after that is basically we're killing people who might have been recruited to our side, who might have been saved to our side. Even if we take real life Nazis, Schindler exists, existed. A lot of people who tried to kill Hitler existed. And in this particular game, we only join with people who are already like us. We basically taking the same approach as Nazis did uh, with them. Nazis were uh, Nazis are ultimate evil because uh, they have actively destroyed everything that was not them, methodically and viciously. And in this game, we nuke uh, a science facility with people who were already for 15 years uh, under Nazi power, who basically, at this point, I'm assuming, just want to eat something and use their strength to some at some extent. We could recruit them. We could have turned it around. I mean. We are not supposed to be like them. We are supposed to be better than them, right? Again, this is an extreme example. I just want to make it clear. I'm pretty, I'm, I hope that it will never be a case, in which case it's a valid example for the world. Uh, I don't think I need to do, explain that. Um, but if we take a different, if we take, for example, even Germany, in which uh, these are not Nazis, these are just some evil audience because then, uh, Germany has certain rules about portraying the Nazis as in you are not supposed to. Not right now, they changed this thing. But essentially for a German kid, like uh, seven years old, who didn't, go to, uh, who didn't yet go to school or something like that, they can still procure that. We can still think about people who will get our games by insidious means. They will still get the information we are giving out. He will just see the wonderful, amazing, huge regime that has uh, colonized Venus and colonized Moon, and that could be insidious. And again, for, uh, in many ways, what we do with we do, again, Nathan Drake could, uh, although Nathan Drake actually da did that, but in many games when we use them as specific example as the cop out, we do this to uh, we do this to the enemies by just showing ourselves and giving uh, our uh, our opposition ammunition to essentially portray us as terror billies like it was done in Wolfenstein 2. Uh, I don't mean to read specifically on Wolfenstein 2 The New Colossus. I think uh, they, have, uh, they have tried, and I'm looking forward to what they do in Young Bloods. I think if they, when they find their voice, it will be extremely interesting to see how they are going, especially 1980s Vichy France, as I'm assuming. Now, it might look like I'm painting a very, very bleak picture. I mean, we had Undertale, and Undertale, a game where you don't have to kill anybody. We have Spec Ops the Line that actively deconstructed the uh, usual uh, Middle Eastern uh, shooter. We have Overwatch where everybody is inclusive. And as a Russian, I really like Zarya. She is not the villain. It's so rare. Uh, even Far Cry 3 initially was intended to deconstruct things. I remind you, after you kill Vaas, there is one more island. And the whole purpose of this island is so that the player asks themselves the question, why the fuck am I even playing this game? And a lot of uh, incongruities and ludonarrative narrative dissonance there is specifically designed to be as jarring as it is, to show like, yeah, this is probably wrong. But isn't this moral licensing right now? I mean, we are doing good. We have all those games. Why should we bother? And the problem with this uh, specific external propaganda is that they just, uh, they work like basically climate change. We use them a lot, they become a useful facilities. We can explain it to producers easily, we can explain it to everybody else. People will understand that just based on the stereotypes that they have on the reality that we are trying to, that basically supporting. And one example that I want to leave is the trope of abduction as romance, wherein a male abducts uh, a woman and the woman falls in love with a man. Regardless, I remind you, abduction is a criminal offense. And we have been doing this trope for about 50, 60 years. We started, uh, it started just as a vehicle trope and an interesting example, and then it just kept going. This was the release last year, passengers specifically. I don't have a specific takeaway from this regard. It's just that uh, the stuff that uh, I wanted just to um, try to make you more aware of the stuff that you are doing, try to uh, maybe. Uh, sideline some hours for editing and review and reflection on the stuff that you are writing, on the stuff that you are doing, so that you are not doing these things. The most uh, common example how to avoid implicit biases, for example, is to consult with somebody who is from that particular culture. Go with Setter Paradox and Stormtrooper Paradox. You 
ca can't specifically do that. Uh, you can't go. You can't always go there, and you can't always know that the stuff that you are doing may result in this situation. Like for example, we all know about, uh, for example, the Red Scare and the continuation of it that shows Russians as evil is uh, essentially hurting their relationship in many ways because it supports reality that we don't want to exist. I'm assuming we all want to be friends. Hopefully, otherwise I will be in the parking lot. <laughs> and yeah. I've heard that the next talk should be more optimistic, so maybe you should look up for that. Uh, but yeah, this is uh, my talk. Thank you. Sorry for making you all very, very sad. And if you're not. So if we have time there, any questions? If there, I just have no idea how many time left. <laughs> We need power! <laughs> um, do you have any suggestions for how to create... Because if it's unavoidable that we will be creating this accidental propaganda, do you have any suggestions for how to create propaganda that will help the world instead of perpetuate uh, horrible stereotypes and romanticized violence? This is what I cut from the presentation specifically, because propaganda tools are the same everywhere, and they didn't want to provide propaganda tools, essentially. It's the same rule of propaganda. You want to propaganda a good idea, you want to propaganda a bad idea, the same thing, literally. I recommend you read Edward Bernays uh, and... Actually, Jacques Ellul would be better. Jacques Ellul, uh, um, Jacques Ellul and Edward Bernays, both of them are called Propaganda or Manufacturing Consent, the books. I used them in the research at some point. And they both uh, they have a lot of emphasis on the ethics of propaganda specifically and why you shouldn't do unethical stuff. And then they tell you how to do this specifically. Like, for example, Ethos Logos, uh, Ethos Logos Pathos is an actual propaganda tool, essentially. So if your designated driver follows the same propaganda rules, the same Ethos Logos Pathos. We like the characters, we like their message, we should be like them. But I didn't, sorry, but I didn't want to give you on camera the actual tools to propagandize. Um, how did you get into this like theme of uh, propaganda and discovering these things? Did you make a game yourself and then discover hey, this reaction was not what I expected it to be, this was not that positive, or like, what did you discover? Uh, I'm, I'm Russian, so I have to appeal to the, uh, to the stereotype of a player that I'm not familiar with. I grew up with a different... I'm, I'm Soviet by birth. I grew up with different values, I grew up in a different situation, and I've been re just researching stuff in America so that I don't offend people or something. Our, r Russian racism is very different from American racism, for example. Everything, like... The whole concept of uh, the whole of their situation with Mexico that is portrayed is as racism. In Russian terms, it's nationalism, which is weirdly more insidious. So I was just trying to Google this stuff and uh, research and how I will not like offend people because I want them to love me. I'm a writer. I'm insecure. Uh, also, um, at one game, I accidentally made a character communist without... Uh, but that was an editing mistake, it was a very convoluted phrase, uh, and it made me think uh, whether I have done something the same way. Uh, this, basically, we cut, cut it out from the game at this point. It, was, uh, it didn't help, uh, it actually somewhat hurt. Uh, I had a nice idea, I didn't uh, act on it properly. And also, uh, I just, uh, just to... Full disclosure, uh, I just figured out that I uh, uh, came up with uh, the most clickbait title for a talk. As in everybody whom I say, hey, I'm doing a talk about accidental propaganda. Oh, wow, that's so interesting. Without, even though at that point I had no idea what it will be about. But uh, essentially, yeah, the first, uh, the serious answer would be the best. Yeah, also, I'm Russian, so like propaganda is everywhere. <laughs> Even the most diametrical, because uh, uh, I speak English, hence I watch, like for example, Stephen Colbert and so on and so on. And even before 2014, 2016, it's uh, almost diametrically opposite opinions, uh, and they uh, that are showed in a different ways on any given, uh, especially on the subjects that are um, that are useful for everybody. And so I was just really fascinated with the spin specifically, with the manipulation of certain topics, so that I can use it in video games. Until I figured out that this is some evil shit. And hence the talk. Mm. 
No, nobody. <laughs> oh, there is one follow up over there. Uh, this is may not be related to the speech, but uh, in Sweden, what's the biggest difference in culture between the, where you live and here, as far as you noticed? Um, <laughs> mm, you think your weather is bad. <laughs> you know nothing. <laughs> no, but no, it's, there are very, very, my, a lot of similarities, and I think it's helpful to think about similarities between people than differences between people, because we can kind of go into how Sweden and how Sweden socialism and Russian socialism is very, very, very different, as in ours produced Stalin. Uh, but uh, in terms of similarities, we are very, very similar. It's just that we uh, try to... When we focus on differences, we will always find differences. Different language, different attitude. Uh, yours is like, your uh, fairy tales are very dark, ours are very bleak. I have no idea why it specifically happens, but when you focus on the similarities, you find a lot of common ground that you can use in this regard. And this is what I try to do when I'm like, writing for American audience or for other audience. At one point, there was um, a client about a game in South Africa, which is as far removed from me as possible. And I was trying to focus on similarities specific, and the client uh, was uh, South African, a guy from Lesotho. Uh, and uh, I didn't want to use uh, the differences between us to highlight them, but more like similarities so that the person from the stereotypical player audience, which is usually Anglo-American, um, can uh, get behind this particular character and this, his particular strives, which are usually mostly the same. Um, so a follow-up on the whole culture thing. Uh, if you're trying to um, if you're trying to avoid propaganda in games, let's say you're trying to make a game, you don't want to make a propaganda game either for for good or bad. Um, what would you have to do different if you were to make it for um, say a Western European audience as opposed to a Russian audience? I haven't done anything for Russian audience ever. <laughs> it's irrelevant; they're all pirates. Uh, but the question is, if well, what uh, if I'm doing the game for the different audience, not the one that I'm used to? Especially if you're try and especially if you're trying to avoid making a game that that uh, makes accidental propaganda. Okay, I would go to this particular country that I'm doing this for situation. I will talk to people from this particular country. This is the usual uh, hire consultants and all this stuff. I will again try to focus on similarities that we can be doing, and uh, I will try to either avoid or hone in and deconstruct uh, some uh, stuff. Like there is a script in my head that I really want to do, but more like for a short flick or something like that. I moved recently last month to Cologne, Germany, and everything is closed on Sundays. Nobody takes. Uh, it takes credit card, everybody is done in cash. It's 2018. And I really wanted to do something that uh, effectively destroys this situation and actually shows it in bad light. Uh, essentially, not like bad propaganda, but more in terms of deconstruction. But I think in this regard, it's not to think about uh, any uh, person who is an enemy or uh, is portrayed as villainous in any game as, uh, as this specifically villainous, trying to give them not more nuance, but to uh, really understand why they are doing certain things that you can actively then use to uh, either destroy these particular bad things or... Um, what was the name? Um, Ghibli movie uh, about uh, <laughs> Ghibli movie about nature. Every one of them. Uh, Princess Mononoke. So Princess Mononoke, ha uh, depending on where you stand, it had two villains. It was overly industrious village that destroyed the forest, and there was a forest that, in response, destroyed this overly industrious uh, village, destroying a lot of people. How Ghibli did that is just uh, the, in the industrious uh, city is not portrayed specifically bad. They're doing a lot of good things. They show why they're doing what they're doing. They just focus on the failure of communication, and not which is we all can understand regardless of our culture. They don't focus specifically on these are the people from the city, these are the people from the forest specifically. These are good, these are bad. They try to figure this out. And to, but you can't do that with shortcuts and tropes, so you have to invest time and resources into this situation. I hope this answers anyway. Uh, what are some uh, examples of game you would say that like, are less problematic and we can look for inspiration when making games that when we don't want to make like bad propaganda and stuff? Undertale. 
I'd say Undertale is the best example. Uh, Spec Ops The Line, again, uh, is also the construction of the middle, like, they are turning the whole premise over their heads. Uh, yeah, basically, the, I've, uh, the ones that I've uh, put there, I put them for all the specific reasons that you're asking for. Overwatch, specifically, I can't recommend their character, commend their character design enough. Like, uh, everybody is represented so well, except for the British accent of Tracer as far as I am told. Uh, that I find to be an odd answer, so I would ask why, because uh, Overwatch has been criticized quite w widely uh, for their character... De the character design has generally been praised as good, but also criticized because there are a lot of stereotypes. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and um, while some countries are represented by voice actors from that country, others uh, are not. So what do you think is good about that character design and how do you deal with the fact that they're still very stereotypical, a lot of them? I will go to the usual, my, Rus my dead Russian horse and Zara specifically. Uh, so Zara has some insidious situations, specifically as far as, I, uh, as far as I know, it might not be right anymore, but her accent in the uh, United States is uh, like this. She talks only when he, she frowns and so on, which is a stereotypical uh, Russian accent. And in Europe, it's dialed down. So they are still doing some of this stuff. They're still using the stereotypes you said, but they're using uh, them well, they're at least not using the usual stereotypes. Because, like, uh, usual stereotype about Zarya would be she would be as evil as you can get and communist to the bone. And she is actually doing the... Um, like, I know some people like Zarya specifically. They're not necessarily good, bad people, and they're showing them this way. Regarding the other cultures, I think... so. I have no idea how it, uh, it is for the characters that I used in specifically Talon. Um, I probably should ask an Irish person about Moira. But it's still, uh, it's more inclusive. The whole point is inclusivity and not like, hey, let's make cheap jokes because Farah is from Egypt. Just the intention itself was good and they invested some money. It's still not ideal, but you can't really do the ideal work when you have so many characters from so many different countries. Uh, you spoke earlier about uh people that, like, uh, to writer, like, we already did this good thing, uh, we're done. Could that be applied to uh, Overwatch when we already have the less negative uh, Russian thingy for Zarya? Couldn't they go further, or is, should we just, like, be happy with what they've done? You mean, can the concept of moral licensing can be applied to Overwatch? Uh, yes. Yeah, probably, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and Overwatch itself might be a moral license just because we already have Overwatch. Let's do World War Three, which is an actual game. Uh, and uh, it, it's, it might be this way. It might be we do a lot of stuff, a lot of bad things, just because we think we are doing good stuff and we just overlook things because we want to like be, yeah, we are us, let's promote us without thinking what is going on. And it's like, I, I don't have any uplifting situation. Really. Overwatch might be just moral licensing in every way. Have you personally experienced like um, a difficulty relating to other cultures after experiencing a game that represents it? I don't really have any examples. <laughs> Sorry, again. Have you personally experienced any difficulties in relating to a certain culture or a group of people? Oh, America. <laughs> okay. Oh, I've, I have been expecting that. The story about Rocky IV. So Rocky IV for me, when I was seven years old in the 1990s uh, Russia, was a story about a guy who trained his whole life to represent his country with the best technological advancements, and then he lost to some guy from Philly who went into fucking wilderness. It was completely bizarre to me. And until I realized the context through which it was portrayed, uh, I did not understand it whatsoever. American culture itself is completely uh, weird to me because it can be viewed as a stereotype, as a usual, like, uh, basically, country of obese, dumb people. However, if you look deeper enough, there are more, more, more uh, deeper uh, problems or even deeper reasons for this situation. Um, but... Uh, yeah, probably with me specifically, that would be uh, America. There is a lot of also the former Soviet Union countries, like for example, Baltics, that are represented uh, certain ways. Uh, Ukraine, but no, I will not continue anything about Ukraine. Um, yeah, hopefully that this answers it somehow.
Then maybe we should wrap up. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much again.